Feast TV is brought to you with support by Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market at Town & Country in the Galleria, and the Raphael Hotel. This episode is focused on the folks who are setting the standard in our region, including the people here at Caldi's Coffee. We're also going to be taking you to the J. Rieger & Company Distillery, the local pig butcher shop, and we're getting into the kitchen at Cleveland Heath. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. a very special episode of Feast TV because we are celebrating our Feast 50 award winners and over 100,000 votes were cast. You're going to meet four of the top winners in this episode today and we're going to be featuring Caldi's Coffee. So we're making a coffee infused panna cotta with a blueberry gastrique and spiced pecans and that recipe is from Frank McGinty over at Caldi's. We're going to be pairing that wonderful and very rich panna cotta with a vignol from Stonehill. And this is actually a late harvest vignol and it's going to play really nicely with the sweet and tart gastrique that we're going to be putting on top of that panna cotta. So we'll get into all of this when we return from our first segment. Let's head to Edwardsville, Illinois and meet the folks behind Cleveland Heath Restaurant. They've got a one-two punch in the Feast 50 and won Best Chef as well as Restaurant of the Year. We met in Salt Lake City um, back in about 2003 and had a pretty long mission to get together and put together a restaurant we wanted to open. Um, but we knew we had some other steps to get here. We moved here to Edwardsville or back to the Midwest in general in like September of 2011 and we had the restaurant open by mid-November of 2011 so we we didn't even sign the lease until October so it all it just kind of snowballed and it the only way it could go was the way that it went it kind of had its own mind I think. It was kind of perfect because we can be indecisive a lot so it went very quickly and I wouldn't have had it any other way I don't think. One of the cocktails that we're, I would say, really well known for, it's probably our top seller, is the Moonshine Mojito, which is super simple. It's a strawberry uh, moonshine, just lime juice and simple syrup, a shot of soda, club soda, and there's a woman here in town who has the best mint I've ever had, and I think it's Kentucky Wonder. So all summer long, we just get these little Ziploc bags from her daughter on Saturdays, and it's fantastic. We have another cocktail right now that we uh, are pretty excited about. It's called the Origami Crane and it's in a champagne flute. It's a uh, Jim Beam bonded whiskey with Luxardo apricot liqueur, um, Amaro Nonito. It's got a, a little bit of a Prosecco float over the top as well. It's a little lemon twist and a paper mache crane. It's cute. People really like it. I think that we're really approachable um, on a lot of fronts. Uh, we try really hard to leave out any pretension. Um, we want anybody here that wants to be here all the time. We want to make sure that you have something sitting in front of you that you're really excited about. And if you find something that you don't like or you want to change it, we're open to everything. You know, if you wanted to have a great bottle of wine and really fancy entrees, you could do that. Or you could come in and you could have wings and a beer and be out of here for under 20 bucks and sort of something for everybody, I think, is what we set out to do. Or a place that we would want to go twice a week if it were in our neighborhood. I don't know that when we set out we really had a mission in mind. I, I think he and I are sort of habitual bar flies and so we wanted a place where people could come and have fun and still get great food. We're going to do our um, chicken fried sweetbreads with uh, green bean and mushroom casserole. They're uh, poached sweetbreads um, soaked in buttermilk and then deep fried uh, and then with the green bean casserole, local green beans, um, oyster mushrooms and basically like a cream reduction. Uh, the uh, green bean casserole is a, kind of a play on the Thanksgiving uh, green bean casserole that served as a, like a potluck. 
We're gonna do our pork belly. Uh, it's um, crispy braised pork belly with uh, watermelon dressed with nook chom, mint, pickled jalapenos, and then kind of our house wing sauce, which is like a caramel sauce. Um, so one thing that I think has really shined for us a lot. We have such great guests, like they, yeah. because our, the people that come in to eat, they're so excited to be here. It makes it so easy to have a good time and the servers really enjoy taking care of them. And we're, we're happy to have somebody that only wants to drink a Bud Light and have a BLT. And you know, like we said earlier, somebody that feels like they want a little bit of a more fancy. Steak and a bottle of Napa Cab or you know, whatever that they need to, to have a great meal. Yeah, we just, we want to make sure that everybody's happy. And we, we are in a town that's very grateful to have food and they're excited to go out. And we're equally as excited to be here and to be a part of that. During that interview, they kept talking about their BLTs and their steaks. But then when you get into the kitchen with Ed, you just see how really, truly creative he is. So if you ever have a chance to head out to Edwardsville, definitely stop by Cleveland Heath for a cocktail and that deep fried pork belly with watermelon and nak chom. My goodness, amazing. Uh, so I am making the, uh, the spiced pecans for our panna cotta. This is a quarter pound of pecans and this uh, skillet is just on medium heat and all I'm gonna do is toast these guys up. All right, we have reached toasted and everybody in the room has commented about how delicious it smells. And it's about to get even more delicious because I'm gonna add two tablespoons of butter to the pan. Now these pecans will keep really easily just in an airtight container. And it's the kind of thing that you can add to salads or use as a snack with cheese in the evening. And if you want to do a different kind of spice mixture or anything like that, feel free to play around. It's kind of a blank canvas. So I am going to add in those spices and it's cayenne, cinnamon, and then also some kosher salt. And now it's just a tablespoon of water. <laughs> and three tablespoons of brown sugar. All of this is gonna caramelize and melt down and form this gorgeous glaze that's gonna cover every nook and cranny of that pecan. Everybody can love fruit pies. My favorite pie is pecan pie, and especially if it has some bourbon added into it. So let's head off to Kansas City and meet the people who have brought the J. Rieger & Company whiskey brand back to life. It is a, a historic Kansas City whiskey that uh, died an untimely death during Prohibition and the great, great, great grandson of the original founder and then also Ryan Maybe of the Rieger have teamed up to bring this iconic brand back. They actually won Best Distillery in the Kansas City Feast 50 poll, so let's head to the East Bottoms now. So in 1887, Jacob Rieger, who is my great, great, great grandfather, founded J. Rieger Co. in Kansas City's West Bottoms neighborhood. Uh, in about 1900, his son, Alexander Rieger, took over and ran the company until Prohibition. And then two years after Prohibition, actually, the trademark expired and it just sat empty. And then it wasn't until 2014 that we finally got smart enough to want to do something different with our lives, and here we are today. Uh, Relaunching this brand, Jay Rieger & Company, is completely surreal and 100% unexpected. When I restored the mural on the south wall of the Rieger Hotel, it was out of excitement for learning about the history about Jay Rieger & Co. We didn't know about the history of the whiskey company dating back to 1887. We didn't know that it, it started in the West Bottoms in Kansas City and then died with, with Prohibition in 1919. We discovered that along the way as we were doing the construction and uh, working on branding the restaurant. Now, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't at the time think I would love to bring back the whiskey, but I also didn't know how realistic of a, an opportunity that was. It was sort of a, a spark. You know, it, it started something, but to now be here with the distillery open and having G. Rieger & Co. back, back in business is, uh, it, it's, it's very surreal. That's the best way I can put it. 
In researching the kind of whiskey that was popular during the 1880s when the company was founded, it was very common back then for manufacturers to blend in sherry. Um, today, this, this art form is completely lost. Nobody, nobody does it. However, it's still on the books. It's still a legally uh, regulated form of making American whiskey, but nobody does it. And to discover that we could potentially blend sherry into our whiskey was an amazing opportunity, in, in my opinion. Not only did it pay tribute to the brand from the 1880s, but it was also, by today's standards, new and innovative. Um, with America, you build a spirits brand mostly based on dark spirits, uh, whiskey being one. And with that, we wanted to make sure that we had something that was very true to the pre-prohibition brand. And so we came out with a pre-prohibition whiskey style using the sherry. In doing so, we sort of created an entirely new category, which was very fitting to the pre-prohibition brand. And so that was very important to us. And starting something from scratch, essentially, from the ground up that you can actually build into a large scale distillery isn't as common, nor is it gonna be as common going forward. And that's really what we wanted to do. We wanted to take this company back to what it used to be before the pre-prohibition years. And we feel like we're on the right track to do so in leading off with our Kansas City whiskey and then going into other spirits as we progress. The number one cocktail I like to make with the Kansas City whiskey is called a horse feather. And the horse feather is pretty much a simple highball using our whiskey, ginger beer, a couple dashes of Angostura bitters, and a squeeze of lemon. It's super easy to make. So the Kansas City whiskey, uh, it's got multiple layers. It really, it kind of goes on and on. There's a lot, there's a lot going on in this whiskey. It's very complex and it's a blend unlike any other. It's so interesting that there's sherry added to that whiskey. And actually, there is sherry vinegar in our gastrique that we're making. And gastrique sounds like a very fancy term, something that must be very difficult to make, and it's actually extremely simple. So you'll notice I just put in one cup of sugar into the pot, and now I'm adding in one entire cup of sherry vinegar. And now into the pot, I was gonna go two cups of blueberries. All of this is going to just simmer together until it gets syrupy and reduced. Again, crazy easy. And this is allspice. If you can take a look at it, it almost looks like a peppercorn in a way. And normally you buy allspice already ground up, but in this case, we're gonna be using it whole. So it's going to impart that aroma, but then when we strain the sauce, it's gonna come right back out. So now I'm just gonna bring this up to a boil. And as this cooks, the berries are gonna burst and kind of break down and everything's gonna get all syrupy and delicious. It's been, I don't know, about 10 minutes or so. And this is thick and syrupy. And I have also, just so you know, added in a little bit of salt and pepper. And if after this, is you know finished up and, and cooled. If you think it needs a little bit of brightening, uh, Frank McGinty, the author of this recipe, suggests that you add a little bit of lime. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, Frank is with Caldi's Coffee, and we're making a Caldi's Coffee infused panna cotta. So while I strain our blueberry gastrique, I want you to head with me over to their new roasting facility in St. Louis. Caldi's is a regional player. They have cafes in St. Louis, Columbia, also Kansas City, as well as other spots around the country. But they won the Feast Magazine poll for best coffee roaster as well as best coffee shop. So let's go meet the guys behind it now. I just can't do it. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying really hard to make noise. <laughs> Cupping is really the heart of what we do here at Caldi's. It's really what the whole industry at some level is founded on. So for us, we take it very seriously. It's how we evaluate all the coffees that we're going to buy. Um, it's also for quality control and education as well. When you are tasting, what are you looking for? How do you how do you evaluate? Yeah, them? so uh, coffee scored on a hundred point scale, and and uh, at Caldi's we're into specialty coffee. Specialty is anything that scores. 80 points or higher on this scale. The scale is mainly used internally, so it's not something that's broadcast to customers necessarily, but it's really a tool, a training tool, but it's also a way to communicate all over the world globally. It's really the international language of coffee. 
In our roast facility, we get coffees from all over the world, and we'll see coffees next to each other. One will be from Brazil, and one will be from Africa somewhere, and it's really cool um, to see coffees all kind of meet back together in St. Louis. So we're pouring about 205 degree water uh, on the coffee for the, for the cupping process, and you know that's about ideal brewing temperature. You know, and one thing about cupping and the reason why we do it and the way we do it is it's an easy process and it's repeatable. This can be done all over the world by people in labs in Ethiopia, Brazil, you know, to Sumatra. So that's an important part of it. You need a grinder, you need clean hot water, and you need, you know, coffee, fresh coffee roasted. For us, relationships at Origin are, are a big deal and a big part of what we do here at Caldi's. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, but really it helps us improve quality along the whole supply chain. It helps improve the farmers' lives. So we work with a, a number of uh, co-ops, and we have for a few years now, um, where we give a lot of feedback on cupping scores and maybe ways that can improve things that they're doing at the farm level so we can share you know, ultimately with our customers. And they look very different. Yeah, so I mean, we have coffees literally from all over the world. Um, so you know, the density of the bean, where it's grown, the altitude, all that has effect on the look and the taste. It's just been such a sea change in people's understanding mm -hmm. of what coffee is and what it can be. I mean, we're going from, you know, what, 20, 30 years ago when people would just have just, it was just coffee. instant coffee yep. or just yep. stuff that's been sitting in a can for yep. four or five months to now people really understand that um, it is an agricultural product yeah, that really. has great differentiation. Coffee is an agricultural product, so it changes from day to day. And so how we roast it will change. And really it's so sensory based that I know like every day is gonna be different. I love smelling coffee as it's roasting. It's always changing. Um, I, I like that idea of it never being perfect. I'm always searching for it, searching for that perfection, even though I know I never will find it. You know, a lot of the aromatics and gases get trapped underneath this layer of crust. So it's one of the most intense uh, aromatic experiences during the cupping process. So one thing that's uh, important about cupping is, you know, even as it's hot, obviously the tastes are going to change as it cools. So we'll taste it. We like walking around the table, maybe tasting each coffee three, four, five times to get a full picture of the coffee throughout its whole, really the whole life cycle of the cup of coffee. So, so take we, us through the process. Yeah, so we would take a little bit on our spoon, um, you know, about the size of a quarter or, so, or something like that. And then literally we're going to slurp it across our palate. And we do that for a few reasons. One is to spray it across all of our taste buds. We want to taste the coffee as best as we can, but also is to aerate it in our mouth. We want to, you know, um, basically engage our sense of smell while we're tasting. So that's a huge part of this. We're learning so much. <laughs> really the great thing about cupping, especially on the educational side, is being able to taste six different coffees from different areas all over the world next to each other, that's when you really start learning and piecing things together. Like what does this great Ethiopian coffee taste like? Well, when you're just tasting it next to other Ethiopian coffees, your reference isn't quite the same. So having all these on the table is a, is a big deal. And that's the other thing I said too, is coffee's so personal. Like when you're tasting this, just this is a great coffee, but so is that one. And this might be in your, in your taste preference zone and that one not, and that's okay. Really, we like to get people excited about it and hopefully open that, that door to where they are excited and they're interested. So that's, that's really the key for us. Quality is very important to us because, I mean, it's just, it's the basis of everything we do and obviously coffee's number one. So we're passionate about it. We love sharing the story and like just getting into the detail like this is what's fun. Like that's the cool part of what we get to do and then sharing it with people. So yeah, I think it's just, it's just, it is, it's what we do. So now we're going to make the panna cotta and the first thing I want to do is bloom my gelatin. If you've never done that before, all you do is pour the gelatin powder on top of water. That's three tablespoons of water. You just wait for it to dissolve. So we've got about half a cup of coffee and you want to make sure that the grind on the coffee is not super fine because then it'll be really difficult to strain the coffee grounds out. So just a tip. I'm also going to add in a couple tablespoons worth of sugar to sweeten it up, then a cup of whole milk, and then three cups of cream. This is going to come to high heat very gently. You don't want to curdle your milk or anything like that. 
This is not a classic panna cotta. There are no eggs, this is not truly a custard. It's being thickened just with the gelatin and then also kind of that thickness of the goat cheese. And I would also suggest playing with things. If you don't want coffee, you can infuse this with tea. You could also drop in some fruit. There are a lot of different ways that you can play with this very basic recipe. One thing that you want to be really careful of because it's coffee is that you don't over extract that flavor. There is a batch that I made last night because they have to let this rest for about 12 hours. And when I made this batch, I turned my back and I let it boil. If you do boil it, just be aware that you might end up with a little bit of a bitter edge to it. Adding in my gelatin. got that beautiful foam to it. Now I'm just gonna add in that goat cheese, seven ounces. This recipe could not be any more simple. All I have to do is strain the mixture and then I'm gonna ladle it into ramekins. I do wanna make sure to get all of those coffee grounds out. And so because I don't have a fine mesh strainer, I just have a regular one, I'm just using some cheesecloth. So Frank over at Caldi's is known for putting on these fantastic coffee dinners where everything is infused with coffee. There are just a lot of different ways to use the flavor of coffee beyond just as a beverage. You do want these to sit in the fridge for really at least 12 hours. I mean, it needs a good amount of time just to get set up. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish all of these guys up. And while I do, I really want you to get to know Alex Pope. He's an incredibly talented butcher and also chef in Kansas City. He has the Local Pig, which is a locally driven butcher shop. Also, he's opened up Pig Witch next door, a second local pig location, and Cleaver and Cork. He's incredibly talented, and he won Best Butcher, Best Charcuterie, and Best Chef in Kansas City. So let's go and meet him right now. So the whole local butcher thing is certainly, you know, taking off and becoming a thing. Um, obviously we do it and there's a couple of reasons. Uh, first and foremost in my mind is access to the best product. As a chef, as a consumer, if you want the best product, you have to go to a small scale producer. And if you want to get a small scale producer, you need a middleman, which is our butcher shop. And the second reason is, you know, a lot of people are wanting to uh, know more about their meats. If you're interested in animal welfare or if you're interested about quality and you want to see us, breaking food down, you can come and watch and you can see exactly what's going into your product and you have no questions about it, you don't have any health concerns, it's just, it's very transparent. The meat is the most expensive thing you're going to purchase that you eat. It can be the most nutritional. You know, having a good relationship with the person that's taking care of it um, is the way we did it for a long, long, long time. Uh, and now I think it's nice to get back to it a little bit. So at the butcher shop, we have a wide range of products. Um, we do chickens, uh, ducks, lambs, pork, beef. Uh, every every week, we get fresh fresh in and, and cut every week. So all of the different cuts that come from beef, chicken, and pork, uh, and lamb, you can get in the shop as, in the cases as raw cuts. Um, and that's kind of the butcher and the charcuterie side. Uh, we make about 100 different uh, products. And you know, there's a few things that I really particularly like. We make a really excellent pepperoni, which uh, is not at all like the kind of cheap pepperoni you're used to. It's got about a dozen different spices and chilies in it. It's um, it's rich, it's amazing. Another one is our, uh, is our Irish bacon. You know, when you're starting to break down a whole pig and you start to get to numbers of them, you have these cuts that you go, what, what am I gonna do with this thing? And uh, we started making, uh, brining it and hot smoking it, and it just comes out fabulous. Big Witch came basically at day two. Everyone in the neighborhood walked in and said, hey, I can't believe you opened a deli. This is great, can I get a sandwich? And I said, no, we don't have sandwiches. This is a butcher shop. And they looked at me like I was crazy and they walked out. And that happened for about six straight months. And finally I said, all right, fine, <laughs> well, we'll do this. It really has barely changed um, in the last two years. We do four sandwiches every day. We do a double cheeseburger, a cheese steak, uh, falafel, 
and a banh mi. And then every day of the week, we do a different sandwich. Um, so every Monday, we do a Cuban. Every Tuesday, we do brisket. Every Thursday, we do pork tenderloin. We make uh, one side, which is potato chips. We make them every morning. Somebody gets here at 7 a.m. Uh, and we fry about 100 to 150 pounds of potatoes every morning. There'll be lines out the door during the summer. So at Cleaver and Cork, what we do is a lot of classic and kind of more interesting meat cuts. Um, you know, we do a pork jowl appetizer. Uh, we do just the money muscle from the pork uh, shoulder as a smoked option. Um, and it fits kind of nicely into what we do here in the sense that it's all still locally raised uh, meats. It's still a lot of charcuterie and it's a lot of, it's all homemade, handmade stuff all from scratch. So it's really a nice representation of uh, all the things we do at Local Pig in a slightly a more upscale environment. It's a nice addition to what we're doing. You know, coming to Local Pig is kind of, uh, is, is a whole experience in and of itself. You know, we don't have a lot of peers for, per se in this market. What we set ourselves apart with is, again, the the local and humanely sourcing, you know, we always we take pride when we can flip a vegetarian um, into getting uh, getting back on the meat train because they can feel good about what we're doing here. Um, there's that, and we do, you know, we do a lot of really fun, interesting, bold flavors. Um, subtlety is certainly not what we're up to. Lots of fresh citrus, spices, herbs, all sorts of strong flavors. I think that's what our customers really react to is, you know, really good customer service, really good products, and uh, excellent sourcing. But we're doing a great job so far, but we can we have a lot more to do. So presto, magic of television. These were made last night, and when you unmold your panna cotta, just run a thin knife around the edge and just kind of assist it, because it's not going to just come out on its own. And there you go. And gastrique, because it has that sweet and sour flavor profile, it's great on desserts, but it also is something that is terrific on meats. So think about it to kind of dress up a pork dish, kind of like what we just experienced from the local pig. So we have our gastrique on top. We're gonna garnish with some of these salty and spicy pecans. So to pair with this really very complex dessert, you need something that's assertive and is going to stand up to it. And so this late harvest vignol from Stonehill Winery is gonna be a terrific pair. Late harvest wines are very, very rich and delicious. And Stonehill is located in Herman, Missouri, which is right in the middle of the state. So I'm going to go ahead and dig into this panna cotta. And I also wanna mention, that uh, this happens to be the fifth anniversary of Feast Magazine. Every time we do the Feast 50, it's our anniversary issue, and this happens to be number five. So I wanna say cheers to all the folks that make Feast possible. It's been a great five years, and I'm looking forward to the next five. See you next time.